And before I get started, how many of you have used Cucumber before? How many use Cucumber regularly? <laughs> how many of you don't like Cucumber? All right. Um, the reason I'm here is that I love Cucumber. And I used to be a Cucumber skeptic. And I think that there's a way that I use Cucumber that makes it work really well for me. And tonight, I want to share that. Um, the, this went around on Friday. Um, anybody seen this? Um, video shows a man. Um, putting out a grass fire with a vacuum cleaner. And when it went around on Twitter, it was captioned software engineering. Um, I, it was hilarious. And after I stopped laughing, I realized it was apropos for this presentation because this is no longer my software development experience. And Cucumber is a big part of why. Um, Cucumber has made more of my work be work I love doing and less of it be devoted to putting out grass fires with vacuum cleaners. So what I hope to do tonight is convey to you not only the tips and tricks about Cucumber, but the overall development approach that has been able to make coding such a joy to me. So I learned about Cucumber from the RSpec book. Um, the first part of the RSpec book is all about Cucumber. And that's important because that kind of says a little bit about the context in which I want to talk about Cucumber today. Cucumber is a nifty tool on its own, but really belongs in the context of test and behavior-driven development. So that being the case, my thesis tonight is twofold. I want to argue first that it's important to approach development in a behavior-driven way. And second, that Cucumber is an ideal tool to drive your behavior-driven workflows. So like I said, I'm here because I love software testing. Many people don't like software testing at all. Um, lots of people don't like Cucumber. Um, and the reason that I think that is is because people don't really grok where Cucumber fits into the whole testing and development picture. It's a very particular tool. And I think it's important to use it in the right context in the right way. And if you don't do it that way, you're going to have a bad time. So. Besides that, I'm also tired of seeing the way people look at me when I tell them that I'm crazy about cucumber, kind of like this. Um, so, here's, so here's the basic outline of what I'm going to be saying this evening. Um, first, I want to get us all on the same page about what cucumber is and isn't. Then I want to talk about how cucumber fits into behavior-driven development. Then I want to talk about some of the problems that people have with it before moving on to how you can get as much out of using Cucumber as I do. What is Cucumber? Um, and we'll find out that what Cucumber isn't is as important as what it is. But I'll start with what it is. Cucumber is an integration testing tool. You'll know that all too well by the end of this evening. Cucumber tests are composed of features and scenarios, which are written in the Gherkin DSL, and step definitions, which are written in the Ruby step definition DSL. Gherkin features, the Gherkin DSL, is designed to look like natural language. And the step definition DSL then uses regular expressions to figure out which, which of these syntactical units you're talking about and want to define as a test. Um, one of the really nice things about Gherkin and about Cucumber is that for any of us that have non-technical team members or non-technical stakeholders that we have to 
work with or put up with to varying degrees of success. Um, Cucumber makes it easy to communicate with them because they can understand what's being written there in a way that they can't understand mini, te mini tests in tax, test units in tax, R specs in tax. Um, Cucumber is comprehensible to non-technical stakeholders. Um, the other thing that Cucumber does that's really nice is that it effectively creates documentation in the form of the Gherkin features as you write your tests. So literally you can use this to create documentation that ensures that your software adheres to what it says. This is an example of a feature written in Gherkin. You can see that this feature has one scenario and the scenario has four steps which are denoted by the given, when, then, and and keywords. So once this when this scenario is run, unlike unit tests, you'll see that the state that is created within the scenario is preserved for the rest of the feature or the rest of the scenario. So the first step is given I'm a registered user. So in that step, we're going to create a registered user and that registered user will continue to be a registered user throughout the scenario. These are the step definitions that we might create for the feature that I just showed you. So if you look at these, there are four step definitions for each of the, for, or there's one step definition for each of the four steps. Um, and you can see that within these step definitions, one of three things is happening. The first one, changes the environment by creating a user and assigning that user to a variable that will be available in future steps. The second step is defined to, to affect a UI interaction. The user is being, or the, the user is, that we're imagining is entering their username and password in the login form and then clicking the login button. So that triggers certain UI events. And then lastly, we see expectations. These are generally written using the RSpec expectations API. Um, but the basic idea here is that you're expecting the, um, you're expecting the environment to be in a certain state. You're expecting things to be a certain way and if that doesn't happen, then the scenario fails. Um, likewise, if it can't carry out the UI actions or if it can't make the changes you specify to the environment, it also will cause all scenarios, including that step, to fail. Um, so let's cover real briefly what Cucumber isn't. Um, first of all, Cucumber is not a unit testing tool. When I, when I see people who try to use Cucumber to run unit tests, it's, I guarantee you, you'll hate it. It's, um, it's just not what it's for, it's not what it does, and nobody would claim otherwise. It's also not a replacement for unit testing. Um, as I'm gonna discuss, it's really important in the context of behavior-driven development to use both unit and integration tests because those give you a perspective on your overall software that you don't get from just one or the other. So if you're going to use Cucumber instead of a unit testing tool, I'm gonna to encourage you not to do that. Um, Cucumber is not low level. You could see that the feature I just showed you was from the point of view of a user. Given I'm a registered user, when I enter my username and password, and that's the goal of Cucumber, is that you can write the features in the words a, re a normal user would use, and then tell what the software should do in light of their actions. So if you're trying to connect Cucumber or couple Cucumber too tightly to your internals, 
if you're trying to test specific methods, if you're trying to test even specific classes, that's not what Cucumber is for, and you're going to have a bad time. Cucumber is not stateless. A lot of us, when we run unit tests, we know that you're not supposed to set up state that's supposed to be, that's supposed to persist between unit tests. Cucumber is a little different. You don't want state to be persisted between different scenarios or features, but, but like any integration test, state is absolutely expected to continue within one scenario. So it's considered a good idea to go ahead and make one step depend on what happens in the step before that. It's what it's for. So I want to talk about Cucumber and behavior-driven development. First thing, I'm going to get us all on the same page about what BDD is and why we should use it. And then I'm going to look more in depth at integration testing and go into an example with Cucumber and RSpec. What is BDD? Behavior-driven development is a development methodology that focuses on, first and foremost, the API that the user sees. So behavior-driven development isn't interested in the internal APIs of your app. Anything, anything that doesn't further the goal of having a usable API that does what you need it to do should not be in your code base as far as BDD is concerned. Um, the way that this is accomplished is with a combination of unit and integration testing where the integration tests are written before any of the other tests and before any of the code. And then the integration tests give a direction for the rest of your test and the rest of your code to follow. This is really important, and I'm going to talk about it more in a minute. Um, BDD is also really nice because it goes into minimal planning up front. The idea is that most of us, I think, have had the experience of projects changing. We've planned to do a project, and two weeks later, it's not quite the same project. And that gets factored into these workflows. So, um, so you kind of hit the ground running, start writing some tests, start writing some code, and then change things as you need to. It fits in with the Agile methodologies. So why should you use behavior-driven development? I think, first of all, we can all agree that we need to know what our software does, right? If you have software that you don't know what it does and you can't tell your users with any certainty what it does, you're going to have a problem. So you need to know what your software does. Users need to know that it works as advertised. Another thing that's really great about behavior-driven development that I've gotten a huge amount out of is testing enables you to take more risks during the development process. So I have two different projects, and one of them I've, is quite mature, um, both of which have over 99% test coverage in both Cucumber and RSpec. And you know, I love working on those projects. I, and those of you who know me know I can talk about this all day. I love working on these projects because nothing can go wrong without my knowing it. I can delete half the app and I'll know exactly what went wrong. I'll know exactly what to fix. And it's pretty much borne out that I'm able to refactor these with wild abandon and there are no problems because I have that test coverage in place and because the test coverage reflects what I need the app to do for my users, I'm able to fix whatever problems come up without issues. That in turn reduces technical debt. That's kind of, kind of speaks for itself. The bottom line is that if it's not important enough to us to know why we're testing the code, why we need to know what the code does, why we need to be able to guarantee that to our users, then why are we delivering it at all? Why is this something that we're deploying? 
So the next thing I want to talk about is integration testing. What do I mean when I mean integration testing? Integration testing is testing that is high level. This is not testing that looks at internals. This is not testing that tests what specific methods do or what specific classes there are. Um, well, in some cases, it might test what specific classes there are. But generally speaking, it want, you want your integration testing to be as, at, at, as high a level as possible um, in the way that you would have a user looking at your software. The user isn't concerned with details of implementation. When you're running a Rails app, your user doesn't care if there are separate database tables for users with different subscription levels or if that's all a subclass of one user, that doesn't matter to them. They, they just want your software to work. And they want it to work as consistently as possible, which is why your integration test needs to cover a large portion of the API. Here's a little more about the relationship between integration testing and unit testing. And what I'd like to point out is that all those things that I just said that integration testing does, the opposite of, is true of unit testing. Unit testing does cover specific parts of the program. It does test things the user can't see. And it is concerned with how individual parts of the system interact. Here's an image, not to belabor this too far, that kind of illustrates the process of behavior-driven development with integration and unit tests. So it illustrates that you're starting with the integration tests, and then within each of those, you're developing unit tests that address that functionality and building it into your system. The main takeaway that I want you to get from this is that unit and integration testing are complementary. These are not things that I recommend doing separately. I mean, one or the other is better than nothing, but I strongly recommend doing both integration and unit testing. So here's where Cucumber comes in. Cucumber is an integration testing tool. Like an integration testing tool does, Cucumber features determine what unit tests are needed. This is really important. Integration tests determine what unit tests are needed. It also gives you important information about how your system is working. If the idea is that your unit tests and your integration tests should pass together or they should fail together. If your unit tests fail and your integration tests pass, that tells you something really important that you wouldn't have known without both of them. It tells you that you have extraneous parts of your code that doesn't work, but it doesn't matter that it doesn't work because the integration tests are passing anyway. The app works the same way as you would expect it to, even though part of it is broken. Delete that crap. That's what, that's what that tells you. You have code in your code base that is baroque and ugly, and you can delete it. On the other hand, if you have failing features with all your unit tests passing, that tells you that your unit tests aren't addressing everything that needs to happen for the integration tests to pass. So your system doesn't have all the components that it needs to have in order to work. That's also important, and you wouldn't get that if you had only integration tests or only unit tests. So I want to go into a demo to just kind of illustrate how it is that what my workflows kind of look like. Um, I'm going to be making a small calculator app. I went ahead and got the whole directory structure set up with this. So we have our gem file. We have our rake file. We have everything working just fine. Um, and this was not supposed to exist. Um, so we have a features directory. That's where our Cucumber features live. We have a spec directory where our RSpec tests live. 
And then we have lib, where our program will go. So I've already taken the liberty of writing a feature for this program. You can see that the first thing that I wanted to do, and it's incredibly basic, is simple addition. And this is how I recommend starting on these. Find something that's really simple, even simplistic, and go from there. You can always build on it later. Now, let's see what happens when we run this feature that I just wrote. Um, whoops. It's telling us that we have undefined steps. So what that means is that we need to define them. So I'm going to go here into step definitions. And it turns out I actually have already written one of these. And all it says, I'm defining given a calculator as creating a new calculator. And that was a part of the API that doesn't actually need to exist. So let's see what happens now. We have an uninitialized constant called calculator. So that means that we're going to have to go ahead and initialize a, con a constant called calculator. Let's go into lib. Um, and we are going to save this. Let's see if I remember to save it in the correct directory this time. We're going to save it here. So now we're going to say, There's our calculator class. Now we'll go into our features slash support slash env. That's where our cucumber stuff lives. And we're going to require that. Um, let's see what happens now. Um, whoops, that explains it. And looks like we have a calculator now. Now, the reason, you know, you can see that this is pretty simple and that it's pretty predictable that that was going to happen. But doing it this way is really helpful because it tells us, it gives us a baseline. It tells us that the system is not working in the way that we expect it not to work before we try to make it work. The only thing worse than a failing test that just won't pass is a passing test that just won't fail. If I think <laughs> those of us that test our software have had this problem before. I have it still, constantly, where you think, oh, great, my test's passed, and um, it turns out that those tests will always pass, no matter what's going on. And that's what this avoids. When you, when you go the total stupid route and just go with what every error message says exactly and no more, that tells you that it's not working the way you expect, so you can make it work the way you expect. Looks like we have another step now. We have to. Given when and then, by the way, are stand for the same thing in Cucumber. It doesn't actually matter which one you use. Um, they communicate to Gherkin that this is a step. So in this case, we're going to be a little fancier, and we're going to actually select this argument here in case we want to use the step definition for something else. So at this point, we don't have code that we can easily enter into here. That's good. That tells us that we need to figure out what we want our code to actually do before we can, before we can proceed. So what I'm going to decide here is that I want it to have a, let's see, OK, so we're going to say, it's going to 
take that as input, and I'm going to assign that to an instance variable. So now we can run this again. And it actually, yeah, no, it won't work. So in this case, I forgot to define it as an instance variable. But it still doesn't work because we don't have that method defined. So what we need to do, at this point we know that we need this calculator not only to exist, but we need it to have a method that lets us assign input. So that's where we go to the R specs. And, oh, sure, yeah. Um, is that better? Okay, yeah, sorry about that. Um, so let's see. And this, I'm, I'm using RSpec, but you can use really anything else. Like, there are a lot of totally defensible options in Ruby. Um, and there's nothing about Cucumber that means you can't use it with any of those. So this is just the one that I'm familiar with. So I'm going to... So we know that it has to have this. And the problem is that that's not really a very good test because it doesn't really tell us what input does. It tells us it has to exist, but it doesn't tell us what we need it to do. So I'm going to add a different test just for that method and say, Um, we're going to go ahead and assign our input, and then we're going to expect it to be a certain way. So here, I've decided that it has to have this API where it has to have this input method and it has to, it has to assign the input as a string to an instance variable. Um, and, it's, and it still doesn't pass because it doesn't have that. Okay. Let's see, does that work? It does. And that's kind of interesting because I didn't expect there to be an accessor method defined, um, which is one of the things that we learn in this process. That's like this kind of thing happens to me all the time, and that's one of the reasons we want to make sure tests fail first. You just never exactly know when it's going to act in an unexpected way. So now we can see that I, oh, oh, it actually did, it did fail. That was the cucumber that passed. So if we go down to spec helper, not that one, spec helper, not that one, spec helper, we, we can, um, we can require the calculator file again. And now it works, and it does, a, it does fail. So the input can't be assigned. The, the input can't be accessed. It can be assigned, but not accessed. So. The thing that we're going to do now, and it's debatable whether we should do this, is we're going to go ahead and decide 
to add an, an input accessor method. The reason it's debatable whether we should do that is that it's unclear that we need that API for anything but the R spec. Um, but we, we added it and it passed, and our cucumber passed too. And that's good that we got here because that means we can refactor. Um, that's another important part. We can replace all this code with one line of code. Still passes. We can, we can delete almost everything we just wrote, and we know that if something goes wrong, it'll tell us. So this is a, this is a really simple example. Um, and I don't want to actually go into that, to all of the details about the output right now. Um, and obviously, in real life, most of us could probably manage to put together something like this without a whole lot of testing up front. But what I wanted to, what I wanted to show you is the overall process of letting the test think for you. That's what, that's what it comes down to. Let yourself be the dumb one and the tests be the smart one. Um, that, way, that way you can make sure that there's nothing your tests don't know. So here are some of the things that I've heard when I talk about Cucumber with other developers. This is the fun part. Um, there are some things that people don't like about Cucumber that actually have to do more with test and behavior driven development. Um, some people don't like that it takes more time before you start coding. Um, and that it feels unnecessary like it probably did with that calculator example. So I would point out here that it does take less planning than most of the actual planning processes that we normally use, um, I hope. Um, so another thing that people don't like is that it makes you look at software from the user's point of view. Some of you might be wondering why this is a downside, and it's really not. Um, it just requires us to step out of our comfort zones a little bit to see kind of how the users are looking at our software. Alternatively, it can be daunting to break down a complex problem into the smallest possible part. And I've had this happen too. And the answer to how you do that is arbitrarily. It, a lot of the time it comes to a point where there's not necessarily one place that's better to start than others. So you just start with something and you know that everything that you put there is gonna be something your software needs to do to work. The, the other thing that I recommend to deal with this problem is call up your uncle who doesn't know what Twitter is Get him on the phone and say, "Hey, Uncle Robert, I want to tell you about I want to tell you about this project I'm working on, and he'll probably groan, but break it down for him, try to make it make sense to him what it does, and then the first time you get to a sentence that says it and doesn't include sort of, write that down in your feature <laughs> so um, so some of the things people don't like about Cucumber do have to do with Cucumber. That I'm not going to deny that. Some people don't like that Cucumber uses natural language constructs with regular expressions. I understand that because I felt the same way at first. It felt inelegant. It felt like there had to be a better way to do this, like machine language had to be more efficient. And it is, but it, but that's not the whole story about Cucumber. The other thing that people complain about is that tests take longer than with other frameworks. That's also true. That being said, now that I have my Cucumber tests hooked up to Travis CI, that doesn't affect my life at all. Once you have your test set to run automatically, and it's not that hard, you, like, you guys, if you're bored in here, I totally recommend that you should hook up all of your 
repost to Travis CI while I'm talking up here. Knock yourself out. Um, because this will no longer affect you. You can just keep hacking away, and when your Travis passes, you can push it to master. No biggie at all. Um, people also complain that it can be hard to organize features and step definitions. I'm not going to cover that so much. Um, I've, I definitely have had those issues before and have thoughts on it, but since information is available pretty widely, I'm going to let those of you who are interested read the Cucumber book yourself. That's what I recommend. Some things, on the other hand, are about the developers themselves. Um, the first thing I'm going to say right, right off, you might already have testing tools that you're using that work great for you. If that's you, keep on keeping on. Like I'm not going to, I'm not going to try to sell you on something different if what you have genuinely works really well for you. Um, on the other hand, you might be trying to use Cucumber for unit tests. It can kind of be hard, despite the difference between them, to keep unit tests and integration tests kind of separate in your head. And so it can, you can have to take, you know, stay on your toes sometimes to make sure that you're actually using it only for integration tests. That's worth considering. Another thing is that people don't take advantage of the tools in Cucumber's ecosystem. Cucumber has an amazing number of tools that integrate with it really well. Um, and most of them also integrate with other testing frameworks. I'm not going to say that they don't. But you can use, um, I'll cover more of them momentarily. But for instance, if you're having trouble with too many features to organize, I said I wasn't going to cover that. But I will say this, um, Aruba. If you're making a command line tool, Aruba contains possibly all the step definitions that you could need to test your gem with Cucumber. Gem install Aruba and organizing the step definitions is no longer an issue for you. So people not taking advantage of those kinds of tools can make the whole process seem much more difficult. The next two are kind of bigger, what I would call culture or attitude smells. Some developers aren't able to articulate in plain language what their software does. This is really important, especially for those of us with non-technical users. If you can't figure out what your software does and communicate it in plain non-technical language, how do you expect non-technical users to figure that out without having the benefit of your experience? Um, so that's an important thing to, to look at. And if that's a problem you're having, it's definitely one I've had before. Um, but what it's telling you isn't that you should hate Cucumber. What it's telling you is that you should spend more time thinking this out, talking to other people, bouncing ideas off of non-technical friends or relatives, that, that kind of thing in order to ferret out exactly what it is that your software does from their point of view. The other thing, and a lot of us have been here, is we can sometimes be reluctant to bring non-technical team members into the fold. Um, I've definitely had the experience of having non-technical team members who can feel like dead weight on the team. Um, they're sitting there telling you how to do your job while you do the heavy lifting. I, I know, but it, Cucumber can help with that experience itself. And so holding out on account of the natural language being more awkward than the machine language, think of it as a compromise to facilitate communications with them. It really makes a difference. Um, that's actually something that I'm working on with one of my current projects. I have a non-technical partner that I'm working on a project with. And Cucumber has made it amazingly easy to agree with her on the deliverables, on our minimum viable product, um, on all kinds of things that we need to agree on in order to deliver our website. So how to love Cucumber. This is the, this is the part we've all been waiting for. This is the part I've been waiting for. So I can start talking about happy things. Um, Loving Cucumber 
for me, has become a really easy thing. Um, but it starts with conceptualizing Cucumber the right way, then contextualizing Cucumber into your project, and then adopting effective workflows around it. Um, and then I will talk about taking advantage of the ecosystem. I deleted the organizing your features slides, sorry. Um, so conceptualizing Cucumber. Cucumber is for integration testing. Um, you can imagine how many people I must have met who are using Cucumber for unit testing that I've said this so many times. Cucumber is for integration testing. Um, that's the first thing. The second thing is Cucumber is for generating documentation. Cucumber generates documentation and makes sure that your software follows the API docs, that it actually works the way it says it does. When you see it as a tool that you need to, that you, where you need to step out of your comfort zone and imagine your software from someone else's perspective, that's when it'll get easier. I think that's a, I think that's a problem that people have is they try to use Cucumber and they imagine it's going to be easy like Minitest. And Cucumber is in a lot of ways for developers a mentally difficult tool to use because it's asking us to look at software from another person's point of view. Um, when you accept that that's what you're doing and that yes, there may be aspects of it that are harder for you because you're looking at it from someone else's point of view, that can really, that can really make things make it easier to work with somehow. Um, so once you're able to do that and break down your step, break down your use cases into features and step definitions, simple ones, um, that's the first step to having a productive relationship with Cucumber. Once you've gotten that done, you can put Cucumber in a productive context. Um, first of all, don't stop unit testing. I said that before. Um, and while you're at it, let your Cucumber features guide your development process. Like I just did on the calculator app, you're watching, you're watching to see at what point your unit tests are sufficient to make your integration tests pass. Um, Take advantage of how easily Cucumber maintains state within a single scenario. That's another really nice thing about it. I mean, I know in our spec you can use before all or something. Was, was there a question? Sorry, I thought I heard something. Um, so I know in our spec you can use before all or something like that. Um, I'm not that familiar with other test frameworks, but they probably have a similar thing. And it's a big no-no. You don't want to do that stuff. Um, in Cucumber, it does it automatically. You want to, you're imagining how a chain of events works and Cucumber holds that in its memory while you're doing that. Um, remember that Cucumber is about the user. It's not about you. Again, that's why it can be a little uncomfortable to work with sometimes. Um, also, when you're working with non-technical people, use that natural language style to make sure you have a consensus with them before you move on about specs and deliverables. That way you have a document, a potentially paper document you can point to and say, this is what we agreed on, no more, no less. That can, be, that can really facilitate things. Next is adopting effective workflows. Integration tests first then unit tests. That's the big thing. Um, if you're writing your unit tests first, then that's kind of like saying, it's saying, I'm going to make a new system, and it's going to do this and this and this and this and this. Oh, and somehow it's going to do this big thing, too. Um, you're kind of putting the cart before the horse. Um, so write the Cucumber features first. And before you get started on any of the other stuff, Talk it over with your team members, technical or non-technical. Um, and then get, get unit tests going. If the unit tests pass and the feature is still failing, you need to 
write more unit tests. That's telling you that there are elements that need to be in place for the feature to pass that aren't. On the other hand, if the unit tests fail and the features pass, that might be telling you you need to either debug your unit tests or refactor to remove the code that's apparently in there but not contributing to anything that your software actually needs to do. So refactor liberally. This is so nice. I have these code bases that are really clean and I can find stuff in them no problem. I would be comfortable hiring another developer and letting them loose in there knowing that they would be able to figure out what was going on because I can delete half my code and it'll tell me what's broken. It's um, when you have um, when you have those workflows in place, when you have that level of test coverage, it enables you to do things like that. Um, and again, I'm going to put another good word in for continuous integration, Travis CI. Um, you can use other tools. You can use Jenkins. Um, Cucumber is friendly with all of them. But Travis is a super easy hosted one that you can use and just let it run your tests for you. No more waiting. So here are a few of the tools that Cucumber works well with. Aruba, like I mentioned, um, provides step definitions that you can use to test command line apps. Factory Girl um, and Database Cleaner and Capybara actually ship with Rails. So Rails developers, you don't even have to worry about in including these unless your company excludes them specifically. Um, the Capybara, if you're, if you're not using Capybara already, I highly recommend it. It's, I've tried using plain old Selenium WebDriver, and it is a nightmare compared to Capybara. Capybara provides a wonderful DSL that you can use to just tell it what you want the user to do, and it'll do it. And when I say it up here, those of you who have used Selenium may not, may not really see what's so much better about it. Try it. It's, I, I'm not articulating very well how much better it is, but it is better, I promise you. Um, rack test. If you have REST APIs, rack test is a great tool to, to test those with and works with both Cucumber and RSpec. Um, that'll work for any, any web apps that are built on rack, Rails, Sinatra, plain old rack, Padrino, whatever you have. Um, and then Continuous integration, continuous deployment lets you move on to new things without worrying about if your tests pass. So I've kind of covered a lot of things tonight, as you may have noticed. Um, and the thing that I want to convey that I've hopefully been able to get across is what some of these workflows and attitudes are that can work with Cucumber to make your life a lot easier. Um, these are some of the main reasons that I discussed why test-driven development and Cucumber specifically are really things that you should look into and that Cucumber is worth giving another shot or a first shot if you haven't tried it before. Um, and I really want to emphasize the last one, fun and happiness. I can't tell you, you guys, my life is so much easier with Cucumber in it. I love what I do. I get to, I get to focus on interesting problems, on developing, de developing new technology, on optimizing the solutions I've created. And it's because I have robust integration and unit tests in place. So, it's made such a huge difference in my life as a developer, and that's what I can hope. That's what I hope it can do for you as well. Are there any questions? Go. Uh, do you think you could elaborate on how it, it helps you to avoid more upfront design? Yeah. Um, the the process that I showed you with calculator, the calculator app. That's what the upfront process for all my apps looks like. Um, what about on something really complex, like a complex 
something like that, I will usually go into it with an idea what tooling I'll use. I mean, it's a matter of experience. So for instance, the like one of the projects that I'm working on now, I just I just started using Rails for the first time as a serious developer. I had played around with it a little when I was first starting. Um, and I had decided based on what I knew the parameters of this project were going to be that I would use Rails. So, you know, I was able to I was able to have in mind a general direction that the project was likely to go. And yeah, if you can see something that's definitely going to create technical debt or something, you don't have to go that direction. I wouldn't, you know, use your judgment. It's not a I wouldn't absolutely say not to use your judgment. It's always messier in real life than it is in an example. Um, there have definitely been times when I've gone test last, and it's definitely not been the most pleasant parts of my project to work on, but I've come out the other end and I'm fine. So <laughs> it's, so that's what I would say. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Anything else? Sure. I have a naive question. I haven't used Cucumber, and um, it looks like when you're doing step definitions, it seems to me like the way that, the way that you structured your files there, like the step definitions were specific to a um, scenario. Oh. There, there, I mean, there must be some way that I'm, you can reuse step definitions. Oh, I'm glad you asked, because actually it'll read any step definition files that are in there. It doesn't, you can even put them in subdirectories. Um, and if it matches, then and if it's if it's in that if it's in features slash, slash step definitions and it ends in RB, it'll run them. So and it's the same thing with the features directory. If it's in features and ends with dot feature, it'll it'll run it. There are also like command line options you can use to tell it your features and step definitions are located somewhere else. But uh, but uh, I'm glad you asked that. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Um, the first thing that comes to mind is um, you, part of that comes down to organizing your step definitions properly to make it easy to find them from your from your features. I actually keep an index, um, a text file. It's an index that you can use to search alphabetically. Um, it sounds like Sam has a better answer to that question, though. What what were you going to say, Sam? Relish. Relish. I have not used Relish before. Oh, yes, 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 of course. Yes, Relish. Um, that's the, Relish hosts the documentation for RSpec and Cucumber, and it is written in Cucumber features. Check it out, yeah. Yeah, that's what I've, I thought you were in, I thought you were implying that it had like a separate app that made documentation or something, <laughs> so, um, yes. Yeah. Yeah, I'm passingly familiar with that. I use RDoc on my gems and stuff, um, which I realize is not as high tech as it could be, but I, but the format works well for me. Most of my projects are small. Um, but yeah, that's a perfectly respectable tool. That's the one that I would be using if I had it together. So. <laughs>
Okay, Rigo. Yeah, I, I'm not sure if you covered this. Um, can I just use assertion? <laughs> I think you can, yeah. Okay. I haven't tried to do that, but yes, you can, since, yeah, you can, you can definitely use them. I just use our spec because it's what I know. Any other questions? All right, thank you.